Hello, good evening. I hope you have your sherry glasses ready in front of you. I have got mine all poured out and the room is beginning to smell delicious. Uh, I know we have um, somebody, at least one, viewing in from the United States and a lot more friends uh, from across the UK and maybe in Europe too. So wherever you are, please make yourself known in the chat window. And it's, uh, I hope to keep up a dialogue with you as, as we go along. Um, well, we're here to talk about uh, Montilla Morelos and Sherry. We're basically here to talk about the great historic wines of uh, Andalusia, but actually they're wines we think really strongly for the 21st century. There are styles here amongst this lovely selection we have this evening, something for everyone, something, a style for every lifestyle. So let's get going and see where this takes us. What I need to do first is, that's it, press the screen. So it's a whistle stop journey. We've got an hour together, so I've got quite a bit to get through. So first of all, we're talking about two grape varieties. We may have six different wines in front of us, but there's just two grape varieties. On the left, on a photo from uh, the Conseco Regulador site, the Sherry.wine, which is a very good source of information for Sherry, we've got Palomino. Palomino makes, of these wines, it makes one, two, uh, three, four of these wines. So five rather, let's think about it, no four. So as we go through, you'll find out which ones they are. So it shows you that it can make wines in every style. Pedro Jimenez equally can make wines in every style. We've got two wines here, which couldn't be more different. Picture here, thank you from montiamarilleswines.com, lovely source of information too. We're going to talk a little bit about food because I think the one thing about having a tasting of these wines is they really make you want to match them with food and they all taste better with the food. Then we're going to have a map because, well, you have to have a map. Um, we're going to have, therefore, a manzanilla from San Luca de Barrameda and we're going to have another one. So that's a quite interesting contrast and chat about one small area with two different wines. We're going to have a fino, which is a uh, well, you'll see what it's like. It's a dry um, wine from Montilla Morelos. And we're gonna have two different styles of wine from Jerez, which are, are, are weightier styles. And then finally, a real, um, um, how can I say, a, a real glamour puss. It's a, it's a really, really sweet wine from Montilla Morelos. And if you have it in your glass already poured, you can see that it's gonna be different. And then I'm gonna say quickly something about how to serve and enjoy your wines. And then if you haven't given, you're welcome to put questions into chat, but otherwise I'm very happy to answer them afterwards. So let's go the other way. And here we are, this is food. I, I really want to start with food because Sherry to me means food and Montilla Morilla is the same. There's a lovely saying in, um, and I've, I've got it here on a card. There's a lovely saying here, uh, that they use in, in this parts with, if it swims, use Fino or Manzanilla styles. If it flies, give it Amontillado or Palo Cortado. And if it runs, give it Oloroso. So that's worth remembering. Swims, Fino, Manzanilla. Flies, Amontillado and Palo Cortado. And runs, Oloroso. So we're starting on the top left-hand corner actually with vegetables, which is maybe... <laughs> maybe uh, not um, uh, either swimming or running, but this, I think, I, I've, quite a few of these pictures I've taken from a good friend, Maria Jose Sevilla, who's a great expert on Spanish food and her Instagram feed has wonderful recipes every day. And she uh, she's put these mushrooms together and you can see a lovely garlicky mix. And I probably would have, um, I might have a, an older Fino or possibly a lighter Amontillado with this. Then if we go up to this picture, it's uh, one of my own snaps of what looks like to me like, I now can't recollect what it was, but it was a picture I took in San Luca, looks like a, um, an older Manzanilla and then with fried fish. Well, you have to have, you know, if it, if it swims, then, you know, it's Fino or Manzanilla. Moving on, we have some rice. And rice can actually take a, uh, even uh, rice with shellfish can, can take something weightier, weightier, it can take an amontillado. Then we move on to the right to a chocolate cake. 
chocolate cake. That's where our PX comes in without doubt. Moving down the right hand corner, we've now got the asparagus. And I think the asparagus could, too, could take either a fino or a monteado a little richer. That's up to you. Then we come to the oxtail. This is such a classic dish with this very dense, rich, succulent sauce and the potatoes. We know we're absolutely back on a winter evening in Jerez, uh, or indeed Montilla. And uh, this uh, definitely, definitely is an oloroso. Then we have some, some more uh, flavoursome mushrooms. And then finally, this is very interesting, a recipe of Maria Jose's, um, which is... Uh, chicken roasted with pinones, with pine kernels and raisins, and then um, basted with flaming oloroso. Terrific dish. So there's all kinds of things you could do, but I haven't, uh, I think I haven't begun to explore all of them, but I hope that if you have something on the table with you, you've also got, I know actually there's one, there's one uh, couple here viewing who've got a whole Spanish, um, meal with them so that's I think the way to do this so let's see what's doing next well here's a map as I said you have to have a map we'll start in here in Jerez capital city Jerez la frontera and we can see the the bay of Cadiz here and well we can we don't have to talk about Sir Walter Raleigh or anything like that I don't think um, but what's important about this is that there are all these growing regions but there's little pink area is Manzanilla de San Luca. So it's it's quite a small area. Um, but what I really wanted to point out was that by, um, my mouse has just been there, it is, you can see the Guadalquivir River, the great river of gold. And in the days of Christopher Columbus, that's where the explorers then were able to sail up, sail up to Seville and take their gold and all their discoveries and it was quite a place. Um, so now the river has, has uh, filled in a little bit, doesn't happen. But on the other side of uh, the river, it, here is a very, very famous nature reserve, Cota Doniana. Now, if we move to the yellow section, we're in Montilla Moriles. And uh, it's, it's inland um, and it's, uh, the soils are very similar. I'm going to talk about the soils. Um, and it's certainly, and you can see the influence is more Mediterranean rather than coming from the Atlantic Ocean. And it gets hot here. So there's a place here called Ethija, which is known as the frying pan of Spain, um, because it is exceptionally hot. And then to the north, uh, just outside the boundaries of the Dio, Cordoba, a terrific city to visit. So Let's start with our first wine. We haven't actually, I haven't introduced it yet, but I think you should just have it in your glass. Um, this is, no, there's nothing uh, textbook about this tasting. I just want you to be enjoying these things. So as I, as you have the wine in your glass, as with each one of these wines, look at them first, appreciate the color, the way the clarity, the way they glint in the glass, and then smell them. There's an awful lot about these wines on, on this table, which are all about, smelling them before you even put them in your mouth. Now, normally, if we were together at a party, we would, or in a bar, we'd probably just be drinking them. But frankly, uh, it's the, you know, that, that's what takes me back to you know, the holiday that we, we all need in Andalusia. So the point about San Luca is, now this is a great picture on the left. It shows you that they do horse races across the sand, um, especially at bank holiday. And there was one, there is one very famous member of, of uh, a very famous family, the Hidalgo family, who, who is also, also manages to be a jockey. I don't know how he keeps his weight down, but he does. Then on the other side, you can see the, the nature reserve. And here in uh, the middle, there's a little old blue boat, which goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And there's one over here too. Uh, and if you sit on this side in a bar on the waterfront, the Bajo de Gia, you'll see the boats come coming forward. So what are the influences? There's the river itself, the Atlantic Ocean, there are salt marshes here, very historic. It's humid, undoubtedly it's humid, you feel it. Uh, and then the town comes in two levels. It's on the ground, there is a, a sea level and almost below sea level. Uh, and then there's a, an upper area too. So the wines can be different depending on the levels. Um, these are really exceptional 
conditions for the growth of floor. So now quick, quick run through on floor while you're enjoying that first wine. And what we have here is a very typical barrel. And maybe it looks slightly unappealing. It's a, it's it's from the Sherry website, but it's it, it tells you exactly like it is. You have a butt which is uh, typically six hundred liters. It's not nothing about new oak or anything. It's this dark old oak container. They they have the very old ones, and you don't fill it up to the top. So you have five hundred liters worth thereabouts of liquid inside of um, as. You know that wine is made by the by alcoholic fermentation. So you have um, the yeast act on the sugars in, in the must, and that fermentation creates an alcoholic drink, uh, whether it's beer or, or wine. And so what we have here though are other yeasts which then come in and they act on the oxygen that's around, they act on the material that's inside the barrel, they uh, generally consume everything else in the environment which changes the character of the wine so normally if you cut a banana it gets exposed to the oxygen and goes brown but with this remarkable layer of flaw then um uh it uh it it's quite uh, it just changes the character of the wine it eats up the sugar it eats up the glycerin eats up the oxygen so you have something that's profoundly dry so let's move on and I will be quite clear and I've had one question about which wine you should start with. Frankly, I don't mind, but I think let's start with the one that is called Lagita. So it's it's this one, if you happen to have it, this charming, charming bottle. Uh, I think um, the bodegas have been great in giving us these, these very representative bottles. So Lagita is, uh, as we'll discover, from the lower part of San Luca. And it's, uh, it, I must tell you the story of the string. So you have this little bit of string here and uh, it's because when people used to go up to the original producer of this, they used to say, you know, can I, have a, can I have a glass? And he'd say, have you got any cash? And the word he'd use for cash is guitar. But guitar also means a guitar string. So in, in time, uh, the word guitar and this winery became became linked up, so it's became La Gita. And ever since, they still had this piece of string, which um, is uh, delightful. So that's La Gita. So here you can see on the left hand side the bodega, one of the bodegas. It's a it's a big uh, it's a big business, and you can see that this photograph is slightly oddly taken, and that's basically because the, these are very narrow streets. You can't get far enough away to do a, an upright photograph. But that's Bodega with its typically high windows that you know when you're walking around the streets, if you've got one of these large warehouses with high windows, that's, that's a Bodega. And then here we have the bottle and it tells you that if you can see that at the top of the barrel, it says fourth. So it's the fourth Criadera, uh, which means um, there's every, time the sherry is moved through its constant system of aging, it goes from one set of barrels down to another, down to another. And you can see also that in this Criadero, if you look at the bottom, it's, it's, uh, there are 1,197 barrels. So there's quite a lot of them. Um, so we'll see now. Now, I'm very happy to say that uh, we couldn't get to, uh, on this particular, outing, we couldn't get to meet the winemakers or get into the wineries, but we have a treat for you in the fact that we've been able to get the winemakers, as it were, to come to us. So when I turn over to the next slide, we will have, um, we'll have, we'll meet Victoria Frutos, who's one of the winemakers. And before I turn over, I just wanted to see if you can see over my, what is to you, my left shoulder. And over my left shoulder, I've got propped up on the wall, which is painted blue, I've got a. This is my. Oh, oh my! It's that shoulder. Yeah, uh, you can see I've got two Venencias, and they're the thing that you use for taking uh, out uh, the sherry from the barrel. And we're going to see two different ways of doing this, or, or two different ones. So here we are. Um, in San Lucar. So very typically, traditionally, they use bamboo ones. So 
later we'll see somebody using one of those. But um, Victoria is using the much more common one here. And um, we'll just see that in a minute. Now I've had a, um, I have a comment, Eric is, uh, eating anchovies and olive oil, very good choice. Um, I haven't got any here, I'm Eric, you're making me hungry. And the arrows on the barrel just mean that it shows you in which direction the rest of the row goes. Um, it's, it's, you, we'll, see, we'll see more of them as you go and you'll see that they're pointing in different directions. So you have a picture of one that's at the end of a barrel. And in fact, you'll see as we, when we turn over that Victoria is standing in front of a terrifically long rows of sherry. They've got 16,000 butts there. It's a lot of sherry. So, um, and just like eater. So let's turn over and maybe you can see a little bit more of what there is. So here's Victoria and she's got in her glass what we have here. Now let's, just before she talks, let's look at it. It says Palomino, 100%. And the grapes come specifically from one very good vineyard. Uh, and they have about four years aging under floor. And here I've got, this is the most up-to-date that I have in terms of stockies and prices. So if you're interested in stockies and prices, take, take a note of this, but above all, go to the website, get in touch with them if you have, if you have questions. So it's, well, let's see, what, let's see what Victoria says and then we can talk about it. Hello, I am Victoria Plutos, winemaker at Grupo Esteve and I would like to show you my wine. This is La Guita, a classic manzanilla, which comes from Pago de Miraflores, a coastal vineyard facing the Atlantic Ocean in the growing area of San Lucas. The local terroir and four and a half uh, years of biological aging and the floor will give this wine a delicious salinity and mineral character. Mm, a wonderful wine to enjoy tea with your smoked salmon. Salud. Great. Well, you can say, I hope somebody, somebody here, I haven't got any smoked salmon, but somebody has smoked salmon. So why would you have smoked salmon with that? Because it has this terrifically lovely pungency in the mouth. It, you know, it feels like it's going to give you that sprinkle of, of lemon juice on top. It's not lemon juice. That's not what you get from, from sherry, but it, it has a, a wonderfully savory, salty character, which would be just the match for that kind of thing. Though indeed for, um, you know, as Eric so suggested, um, sushi as well. Um, so you'll see she has her, her uh, um, Valencia in her hand. Uh, and then you'll see that's a very long, long, four very long rows of um, uh, barrels, there are many more than those. And behind her, just behind her head, I think you can see that that one says it's the first Criadera. So, you know, you, you can follow the numbers. And then next to it, you can see that this is obviously a public part of the, the winery because um, the, it's got, uh, uh, people have, have signed the barrels. And it's a tradition if you go to many areas to, to sign the barrels in white chalk. It's and, and people who, who are on this uh, on this call who um, uh, have never done it. I mean, it always seems like it's super easy. I tell you, it's not. The trouble I've had signing signing those barrels is my is is it's not easy. But that's a great tradition and a fun thing to do. Is you can walk around and see who who's been there in a historic cellar. So I uh, yes, uh, a comment about using a Venezia. I have Venencias and I have tried to use them and it's something that they like to get you to do in um, cellars when you visit, but it goes everywhere. Um, uh, it can be done. Best thing to do is to stand in the bath or do it in the, in the garden or something, but you, I think you really have to throw yourself into it with, with confidence. So I hope you now get the feeling of, uh, of La Guita, um, San Luca to its its heart, you know, that's that's uh, there's no wine like it. You smell that and you know where you are. Now, here's another one from San Luca. Let's get ourselves going forward. Here we are. So this is 
uh, a wine, another very famous wine. These are, these two are very well known in in uh, of the San Lugar of uh, Manzanillas, and it's a company called Barbadillo. And I had to have the picture of the red door because that's a very very typical thing. And then going from the hot street in through the red door to to the Soliar Bodega, and I have to. Uh, confess that I'm. I have an interest here. I was once made a, a Dama de Soliar and a lovely honorific ceremony, so I always have a, a warm feeling to Soliar. So now we're going to have an introduction to Soliar. And first of all, though, I want to introduce the lady at the top, Monsieur Molina. She she wasn't able to do the, the tape, and she's the head winemaker of a really enormous business which runs from. Um, the best-selling white wine in, in Spain to uh, all sorts of other um, very fine sherries. Uh, she has a great technical skill and um, very, very interesting person. And she's uh, somebody certainly to get to know. So we'll see what Tim has to say. Uh, I think what's very interesting about this, this is also made Palomino, very similar um, to the previous wine, what makes it different is the place and uh, the place of aging and how they they manage it. So here, what they've done is they age it for a bit longer. This is more than six years aging, but during its life, the wine is moved um, from barrel to barrel slowly um, uh, through different bodegas. So it goes into four different buildings. Each bodega is a building and it goes into four different buildings. And the last time, uh, the last one it enters is this one that Tim is standing in, I think, or maybe it's not, he'll tell us. But the last one it goes into is facing the sea, the sea facing wall. So that's one where, although they're up on the hill where the breezes come up, they're actually facing towards the sea. So it's the most exposed to the sea. And what they're looking for here with these wines in this part of the world is that saline character. Is there salt in Manzanilla from the sea breezes? No, probably not, but there is something tempting. So let's see what Tim has to say. Hello, uh, my name is Tim Holt. I work for Barbadillo on the export side and I'm here to show you uh, Solia Manzanilla, uh, which we have maturing here uh, in this cask in the maturing stage, uh, in what we call a criadera. And here it is to show you what it looks like. Uh, and it's maturing in this uh, amazing cathedral bodega, which we call Arabola di Iga. So one thing I forgot to point out to you is that Tim, well, you saw that he was using a bamboo uh, Valencia, uh, but to get through, because there is a crust of floor, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a soft crust, but there is a crust of floor covering covering the sherry. Is he gave it a little twiddle, so that he could get he could get the the Venencia clean, cleanly through the the floor and then bring it quickly and cleanly out. And that's the technique. I mean, uh, as Kate mentioned, she'd love to learn to use a Venencia. I think <laughs> that's as far as I could get. But getting it in and out of the barrel without having uh, floor in it or too much floor is, is, a, is a real skill. So we have here two quite, uh, well, well, wines are clearly in the same family, but slightly different. Wines, both of them wines that you'll see in the, in the spring fairs that they have uh, across, across this region, oh, and, and indeed many parts of Andalusia. And um, this is a, bit, is a bit older. I think it's, it's a personal style. Uh, this has a, a a richness, perhaps, uh, whereas the um, Lagita maybe is more uh, excitingly pungent. So it, 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 you know, horses for courses, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, you know, you, you know, I hope, I hope you'll learn from this, that this is, this is San Luca without a girl, which is why I'm not going to take you somewhere else. You saw on the map. Hello. No, we've gone too far. There we are. Um, you saw on the map that we started off on near the Atlantic coast uh, with San Luca and Jerez. And now we're moving inland for the first of all wines from Montilla Moriles. And this is a, 
a, a fascinating, fascinating region. So we have soils which are very similar to the ones that you'll find in in Hereth. The point about the Albaretha soils, the clay, calcium, marine fossils, they are glintingly white. You practically need uh, sunglasses. And when you, you go to these regions, you have these rolling hills, and then you have this terrific soil, very absorbent, um, which retain the water when you've got ultra dry summers. And as I said, it's terrifically hot. So here, with this one grape variety, which in the original picture I showed you produced a, a white, uh, white pinkish grape, um, you can let it get more and more raisined. As you can see, they're drying it out in the sun in the bottom picture. So you can make a, a dry fino, um, like, a little like the manzanilla. Uh, you can make an amontillado. Now, we always talk about the world talks about Amontillado in Jerez as if it's the only Amontillado there is. But in fact, of course, Amontillado was made in the Montilla style. It's an Amontillado wine. So the original Montilla. Uh, then they'll make you an Oloroso and a Palo Cortado. And then this thing at the end, I can't call this a thing, but this... Um, um, glorious uh, sweet wine at the end, which is the very essence of Pedro Jimenez. So depending on when you harvest it and where your vineyards are and the choices you make, you can either make what will become our third wine or you can make a succulent, succulent sweet wine or somewhere in between that. And we certainly have, you know, there's a, a wine here which is um, in, in this region, which has got a hundred points from Robert Parker, it's you know, so uh, I think the adaptability of this variety is super exciting. The name itself of Pedro Jimenez is said to come from a sea captain from um, thousands of years ago, but I'm oh, well, hundreds of years ago, but I'm not I'm not really sure that that's the case. Um, so let's have a look at our third wine which comes from uh, Bodegas Alvear. It's the one that's called Fino CB. Uh, and in a minute, Fernando Alvear will explain to us what it's all about. But I wanted to show you a few things here. This is, this cellar is very typical, could be in, could be in uh, Jerez, could be in Montilla Mariles. You can see there, you have the woven screens to the windows because the light is, very bright at certain times of the day. You can see the, so the, the I was gonna say soil, the ground, the point about um, uh, a well-maintained cellar uh, in, in the, this, this part of the world, in, in Jerez and in Huelva, um, is that you will have a, a typically soil or uh, sand on the ground. And then you can moisten it at any time. So if you want to, if the, if you feel that the cellar is getting too too dry, and you want to raise the humidity, super important, so the barrels don't don't dry out, or, then you can always dampen that that. So that is a reason. If you're if you're going to visit um, the winery, any of these wineries in nice suede shoes, don't uh, because they'll, you'll end up with damp sand around the edges. Um, but you can also see probably if you look closely that these this is, these wines all come from the CB, which is what we're about to taste, the Fino CB. But for instance, the one in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see it says one of four, three, six. And then if you look, and there's arrows going in different directions, um, maybe in this over here, you, know, you can see this says one in 1,200 and something. So there's a lot of counting. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's just a, a non-computerized system of knowing where you are in the cellar, uh, because it's important to say, we might think looking at this, that the wine just sits there, uh, but of course it doesn't. Uh, it gets, um, a small amount of it gets moved into another barrel and one, well, let's actually let's start at the bottom. To do some bottling, you take wine out of the out of the, the final finished uh, aged wine. You take some out of the barrel, not a large amount, but you take some out and you do it from a number of barrels and then you need to top it up. So then you 
refill with some wine from the next age and that leaves a space and you keep on going and that that's called a saka and rocio so you're saka you're taking it out rocio you're watering it over and that's uh something we're going to see a little bit of later anyway that sets the scene for this wine fino cb which is looks exactly like well slightly different because it's it's uh, got it's a little bit younger than the one we had before, uh, Soleil. It's, um, we'll discover it's five years, but it uh, looks effectively the same. And it smells similar. Now you must think about it. We know when I've finished, I think you need to spend the evening with these wines, going back to them as they, as they warm up in the glass, um, considering. But this is, this is really a fino, but it's made from Pedro Jimenez. Uh, for this super adaptable variety. So let's turn over and see now what Fernando, who is the uh, CEO, obviously and the, the, still a family business, what Fernando has to say. Hello, my name is Fernando Aldear, the CEO of Bodegas Aldear. Aragonery was founded in 1729, almost three centuries ago, and it's still handled by my family. Fino Cebe is a beautiful and unique unfortified Fino made from the finest Pedro Jimenez grapes of the Sierra de Montilla and the flagship of our bodega. The brand CB comes from Carlos Villanueva, the cellar master in the 19th century who used to sign with his initials the cask containing the best wine. I hope you enjoy the wine as I do. Thank you. That's a, a very speaking um, presentation for all sorts of reasons. Um, I was telling you, uh, we were talking about Criadera, so you can see that that's uh, the first Criadera, but you can also see in the bottom right hand corner, the Solera. And that, although we talk about the Solera system, which is the technical, which is the overall name that people use for uh, the way um, these styles of wines are made. In fact, uh, the Solera is the bottom level or well, it's the final layer ready for bottling, typically was found on the ground, hence the word solera from sol. Um, and uh, you can see also, uh, you can see the, the number 1733 on that first criadera, but you can also see when they last topped it, because they put Rothio on it, and they've said that it happened on the 10th of July, 2020. And that's uh, that's you know you, that's how you do it. And using a, a, a chalk, then you can brush it out next time you've done it. So that's very helpful to see that. He's, and they've only had to write it on one because some poor person has gone all the way down, topping and uh, emptying and topping, emptying and topping all the way down. Um, so that is uh, for me is super interesting to see. But I think also to show that. Um, and some conversation about what the style of this is. This is a, a fino. It is a. It's got more. Um, you know, it's got more body to it. It doesn't have uh, perhaps the some of the hidden fruit. Um, you know, for instance, if you go back to something like Lagita, it has an appley character uh, to it. It has a little bit of chamomile. It's quite a, um, a, a, a delicate thing. This has a little bit more structure to it, and it's something you would enjoy. Well, I don't know, I'd love to know what you've got on your tables, but it's something you could have with, um, I'd quite like it with a, a, a super interesting cheese like Conte, something like that. Um, of course, you can say Manchego, but you need to have a really good Manchego. There's a lot of, you know, if I buy man, Manchego in the supermarket, you know, it doesn't really taste like Manchego. I need to go to a specialist independent deli for that. Um, so, also, what I'd really like to point out, because it's uh, something that I was very confused about when I started learning about sherry, is that, um, that you can get such ripeness on the on these on Pedro Jimenez. It is a different variety that they don't need to fortify it. So, when I was first learnt about um, fino from um, Montilla Moriles, they, the, the, I was, I was told, no, 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 it's, it's all a lie. Of course they fortify it, and you know everybody does. Um, but actually, 
the nature of, of the grape variety and the place and, and the fact it's so, it is different from Jerez. It's not far as crow flies, but it is different, makes a different wine. And it's a, quite a nice choice to make. Um, um, and uh, I've just been, and I noticed from the conversation that my, my Spanish, uh, thank you, has been corrected by my colleague that indeed, uh, I use sol, but of course it's suelo means uh, floor and therefore soler is the cask nearest the floor, which we can see along here. So I think I want to make you make it clear that for this, this particular fino is, is not fortified. It has that warmth, but it does generally come from the place, the sunshine, the reflected heat on the grapes. And, um, but it has a, a, a savory nutty character, which is super interesting. So it would be good to, for you to go out at the weekend and get some more uh, cherries and, and compare them and, 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 and see how they are. Because um, I, I, I think that this, you know, once you start looking, you know, it, it's just so exciting to compare the different styles. And Alvear, as you see, is one of, you know, one of the really established name, very, the most established name in, in Montier Moriles. So yeah, so here we are. We have the one thing I think I also want to say about these three wines is they, they to use the correct term, um, is they're biologically aged. That's to say, uh, you know, they floor plays a part in these. So this it there's no fun way to describe it. Well, I was in a conversation, uh, um, Instagram conversation online the other night, trying to talk about how you could how could you communicate the joy of these wines to um, to millennials and they can seem complicated but I think it's very clear we're either dealing with younger or older wines and um, they have they develop different more complex characters as they get older um, it, then if you want to go further and I think probably a number a number of us on this call maybe do want to go further but if you want to go further either via one company or tasting all sorts then there are lots of opportunities but the key thing is that we have these three wines, which are very super clear, uh, super pale in front of us, which have um, been protected by floor. So unfortunately the word they use is biological aging, which, which somehow doesn't, doesn't sound great in uh, English, but it, that's what it is. So in a minute, we're going to move to oxidative aging, which again, doesn't sound, doesn't sound very appealing either. So oxidative aging is obviously the wine has had a chance to come into gentle, slow, maturing contact with oxygen. And that's what we have uh, with this wine. So let's come to our first wine. Oh, there we are. And that's going to take us back to Jerez. Now, just what um, these pictures are, they may seem, uh, the one on the left may seem cliched, but that's that's how it is. So on the right, we have this glinting Alberitha soil, the abundant Palomino grapes. Really look at that, abundant. And then if you've been uh, touring the vineyards or the beaches uh, in the day, then you come back into Jerez and genuinely you can uh, listen to people singing, people are out on the streets and they're drinking sherry. And, and beer and gin tonic, but they're drinking sherry and they're having small bites to eat and it's sociable. And even now, I mean, I've seen photos that people are having to be careful, but you can still do it with distancing. So um, I think the, the sherry, sherry habit is alive and well, even with distancing. So with uh, the first wine is the Williams and Humbert Oloroso. And Oloroso is a wine that never had any biological aging. Um, whereas um, if you had an Amontillado, it would have had some time as uh, a Manzanilla Fino style before it was then exposed to oxygen. So that's what really characterizes an Amontillado. So we have, uh, yeah, um, here, in fact, is uh, um, uh, some Fino barrels um, from Williams and Humbert, who have a very, very diverse collection of wines, quite an interesting selection to explore. And here is um, Paolo Medina from Williams and Humbert. So we've had 
three women winemakers. There's a, um, there's a change in this generation. Um, and the, um, I think each one of the women so far is doing very good things. And Paola particularly is, is, is thinking about all sorts of things like vintage wines and uh, all sorts. So there's often something um, fun going on in, in her head. So let's have, well, let's maybe, um, let me outline where, where the wine comes from. And as you can see, Anina and Carascal. So now there's a trend really to name those vineyards. People always knew them, but maybe as consumers, we didn't ask those questions. Maybe, you know, Burgundy vineyards have been telling us what their vineyards were for 500 years, but somehow it, it didn't happen in Herith. And now it's super important to show that you have, these are famous names as P Pago Miraflores was before. Um, it's fortified, straight after fermentation, they, you know, you, you select the, the right kind of um, more, um, okay, I'm making it more uh, full-bodied wine. And, you know, that's the style that you want for Oloroso and it's aged for over 12 years. So people sometimes say to me, oh, but sherry is, you know, it's, it's, oh, it's 19, 20% alcohol. Well, no, it's not. If you're having finos and manzanillas sitting in the sunshine, it's, it's a light, it's a light wine. Uh, no more alcoholic than what you would be drinking now in, um, you know, from around the world, red or white. Uh, this is a different case. And um, maybe you, you drink it slowly in a more different way, um, but it's the equilibrium is the same. So let's um, uh, have Edward introduce the winery. Hello, I'm Edward, an amateur criaderas and soleras of our Williamson Humbert collection, 12 year old Oloroso. As you can see, it's a very light and very dry Oloroso. And I would recommend it to have now, for example, with a barbecue, a meat barbecue, and serve very, very chilled. Cheers to everyone at the Big Fortified Tasting. Well, there's lots to say there, but particularly I want to say cheers to the Big Fortified Tasting. So, um, we uh, every year, if you if you work in the wine trade, you have the, a great uh, good fortune uh, to go to a, a trade tasting where you get to taste um, uh, the the ports and sherries and Montilla Moriles and fortified wines from around the world. And it's f to help the wine trade decide what they're going to buy to sell to us as consumers. And it's a great event, but obviously this year it never happened. But the bonus was that instead of having a private trade event as the big fortified tasting for the wine trade. Uh, we as consumers have had, uh, and some members of the wine trade also listening, have had a chance to have this, this uh, tasting ourselves. And it's, um, that's maybe one of the good things that's been coming out of this funny time is the fact that we, we through um, video shorts have a chance to get inside the winery. We, we can't travel to Hereth perhaps yet, but. Um, soon enough we can and really get a feeling of the wines and I think this wine this Oloroso really gives me a feeling it it's uh, has that aroma of vanilla of walnuts of um, uh, it's got chocolate mocha in there as well it's something when you're doing tasting notes which uh, from the 1st of August I'll be doing for, for a month we're doing the decanter world wine awards we have 17,000 wines to taste, which sadly we couldn't taste in April. Uh, they were going to be tasted in the, what is now a Nightingale Hospital, but was Excel. So now we're, we're tasting them elsewhere. And when the sherry days come up, it's an absolute treat. The room is filled with this terrific aroma and that people bring salted almonds and chocolate brownies just to, um, just to balance up um, the wines. But this is, superbly complex I hope you'll agree and I think it's something that you should be thinking about definitely as Edward says it's obviously for barbecue but it's also it's for something with uh, a wonderful meaty dish and I also think that my friend Maria Jose in an earlier picture she roasted the chicken and used and used the oloroso to flambe it and I have uh, roasted lamb I quite often roast lamb in if I'm extravagantly in a bottle of oloroso too but it's the outcome is Great. 
So I think this is one of those occasions I have done, and I'm sure many of you, are, uh, for sherry lovers have done, is I've used sherry instead of red wine with a meal. And people's first reaction is, is a little bit nervous. And then when they have it, it's absolutely, um, you know, they, they understand just how it works. Possibly you could have this wine with a, a blue cheese. It's certainly otherwise, if you wanted to, you could introduce it um, uh, as a, sounds grand, a cheese course, but you know, after a main course, or in, instead of a main course, cheese and olores would be a great match. But um, the other thing that's interesting is I'm going to talk about um, wine temperatures in a minute, uh, but here um, uh, we have a suggestion that you should serve it a bit chilled. So as you wish. Now we- Hello. Oh, him again, forgive me. Uh, there we are. <laughs> we're going to move on uh, in the same town in Jerez, but we're going to move on to another famous name, Lustau. And we're going to move on to Palo Cortado. So this is a really, um, how can I say, Palo Cortado is, that, uh, is a cult wine, um, or a cult category. And that's because at the beginning, maybe, of its life, it was a thing that just was discovered in the winery, that maybe through a confluence of um, the particular vintage and the nature of the grapes, the handling of them, something that had happened in the barrel, it turned out this way. Now, of course, winemakers understand what's happening in the vineyard um, and with their grapes, and they can select a, grape, a wine to be Palo Cortado from the beginning. But you'll see on the bottle that above the words Palo Cortado Peninsula, there is a slash with a cross through it. That's the, the Palo is the almost vertical um, slash that the winemaker would make on the barrel to indicate that he found something that was out of line and then the, the cross would confirm it. So Palo Cortado is, yes, uh, definitely, it's very nice to have one to show tonight. And I did think about whether I was going to put it before or after the Oloroso, because it's um, intended to be um, a wine that's between the that delicate um, refinement of Amontillado and then this full body of Oloroso. Uh, and well, you, you can see how you feel, but I think I wanted to show you the Oloroso first so that you could understand then the difference of Paulo Cortado. Um, let's listen to Sergio as to, he's going to introduce the cellar where he is, the Imperatrice cellar, and then talk about, there we go. And then I'd also like you to think at the end of his tape, you will see that the doors open onto another bodega and it just shows you the connectivity and the extent of these, these cellars, the way they go one on for another. The small solera of Palo Cortado Peninsula aged in Bodega La Emperatriz, built in 1848. It has 12 years of age and enjoys the full body of Oloroso in the mouth and the finesse of Amontillados on the nose. A unique wine to, to be drunk, slightly chilled with savory and spicy food. Salud! Yes, so you can see the extent of that cellar and how you can just keep on walking. And it, it's uh, in, on a hot day, these cellars have a beautiful, beautiful temperate temperature. And then you step outside and in that corridor, before you get into the next cellar, it's very hot. Um, now it's interesting tasting this, but I do think this Palo Cortado would be very interesting with something spicy. Um, as he says, uh, I was just thinking, uh, we had a Korean curry last night, which is quite hot, um, Korean pork curry, but actually uh, it had a sweetness to it, to it as well, uh, which might be a nice contrast. I think you should think about pushing those kinds of boundaries. Let's, let's get away from the European eating, uh, European ingredients, and let's think about you know, what can, what's coming from Asia, what's coming from Singapore, what's coming... Um, 
with spice in it. Uh, I think, you know, this is, this could be, you need the alcohol to balance that kind of spice. And this has uh, definitely, now there's a, there's a, another way you're supposed to be able to spot Parla Cortado because obviously I've, be, I've been through the master wine exam system and um, you have a blind tasting and can you identify, this is Parla Cortado. So one of the ways, Yes, you can. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's definitely different from the Oloroso. Um, but if you didn't have somebody to compare it with, one of the things you're supposed to be able to say is, well, it has a, 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 a lactic buttery uh, character. I'm not sure I know whether that or not, but it certainly to me is, you can see that it's a, a wine with uh, some age. That it's got the alcohol you'd expect. Um, it's got um, that very refined colour and it's not, heavyweight. It's a very nice choice for uh, a warm day. I was just thinking tomorrow the Tokyo Olympics was uh, is, would have been starting and one could have sat back and watched the opening ceremony of Tokyo Olymp Olympics with a glass of the Palo Cortado and had great pleasure. So sadly we're not, we'll instead be, um, um, we will instead be continuing to something which I think will be even more memorable. Um, in the meantime, I see that there was a question about um, Tinajas, but I think, um, yes, Eric, you've answered that question, um, uh, hopefully, and everybody's happy with it. Right, so here we are, we come to the end, now for something completely different, and I would just say on your tasting mat, it says that it's PX 1990, but in fact, what they what we've got is PX 1994, which is the next one in the marketplace. And uh, it is delightful that they have specially packaged this for us. But what it represents is something um, very typical of Antonio Sanchez, who's in the photograph here, who has um, a terrific museum. He's fascinated by the archaeology and history of the region and you know, if, if you, uh, it, it therefore makes this place a, a lovely place to visit. He's always in every photograph dressed like the essential Andalusian gentleman. There's a, a perhaps two people one can pick out there. There's Beltran Dumec, who's just retiring as the president of the Conseca Regulador, and there's Antonio Sanchez, who is so point of use. And he's standing beside um, his, um, because more typically you would expect to find the wine that we're tasting in um, with one of those labels on the right. Um, but on the left, I just wanted to show you this picture which shows his, his range or part of his range because the second bottle in from the left is apparently in a, in a light bulb. And it's a most delightful thing. It's, it's Fino Electrico. So uh, what happened was the, the winery um, was, uh, or, took over a regional energy station, a regional e electrical center. And people joked about it, the fact that it was a, um, giving the wine electricity or um, energy. And so it became Fino Electrico. Uh, but what was even nicer was that you actually can get it in a light bulb. I haven't seen it in the UK, but I hope that um, anyone who's on the commercial side listening here would bring, bring Fino Electrico in because it's, in its light bulb, because I think it's great. So anyway, Antonio Sanchez, very important. Um, I just had a question that before I go into to our, our next page, um, the Palo Cortado. So there is that, I get a, um, a more restrained, a more elegant, understated note than I did from the, on the nose, than I did from the Oloroso, which really tells you you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know, take notice of me. I'm cocoa and, and walnut and vanilla. It's, 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 um, it has a number of those characteristics, but in a much more subtle way. And I think if you're eating food quite often, you don't want to have it, anything that's too, too aromatic. It's a bit like a Sauvignon Blanc, that is just too dominant. Sometimes you want something more restrained. Then in the mouth, you have a number of the characteristics. You have a number of the characteristics which you would find 
in the Oloroso, but again, more restrained, but particularly it's still, it has a freshness. And what's interesting about these wines is that as you get into the oxidative styles, they're older, um, you know, 12 years, but more. And we just joyfully say, well, this is wine's 12 years old, or it's 20 years old, or it's 30 years old. Um, but actually they're fresh still. So what I, th I think I get here is a fresh note with maybe as a mouth-watering characteristic, which makes me, it makes me think of, uh, you know, crunchy green apples. Uh, uh, people will also talk about things like, um, uh, mahogany tables you know does it make you think a little bit about um, the uh, smell of and taste or imagined taste of great furniture and then there's a creaminess to it there's something about it which also says um, do I feel this tastes a little bit like melted top quality vanilla ice cream uh, and then there's this lovely warmth at the end and maybe even a possibility of red fruit so I think I think quite often it, it's, it's hard with sherries to find the word. It's just that next time you go back to it, you say, gosh, I recognise this, um, how good it is. Um, but I think often having it with food will really help you unlock what you think it tastes of. So once you put it with um, a, a fine hard cheese, for instance, it will bring out the character brilliantly. Um, but yes, I think food matching really helps in, 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 many, in many cases, uh, just as it does with, a let's say, a tannic red wine when all you can taste is the tannin. So we have a question here from Simon. And I actually haven't tasted this wine yet because I couldn't taste it before the tasting because I knew that after this, you can't go back. So I'll just taste it now. Hmm. So what Pedro Jimenez like this gives you, and you can get from, uh, you can get it to in, in, in well, both in San Lugar and Jerez, but this particularly is so distinctive. This is probably, um, well, uh, it's, it's between 300 and 400 grams per litre of sugar. And so we if you divide 300 into by five grams, you get, it's about, um, is it 60 teaspoons of sugar? in a litre. So we've got about um, a bit less than that here, but it's super intense. But what I would say is that it's also fresh. It's got, it's, um, it's not a heavyweight. I mean, compared with some of the ones that you get that I have had in, in Jerez is they are quite weighty, but this has a, um, it has a sense of lemon juice in it, which which lifts that sugar. So when you start, yes, golly, it's gone. But maybe it's like having um, um, a barley sugar feeling, um, which has that sense of a dose of lime or lemon behind it. So yes, you've got the succulent wine, um, but it's great. And in a minute, I've got some I've got some dark chocolate here. But let's go back and let's go now to Antonio. Yeah. Uh, this is a Toro Abala uh, Pedro Jimenez, uh, the vintage uh, 1994. This is my favorite wine uh, on all collection of the wine. Uh, the wine is aged uh, during uh, 28 years approximately, and uh, this gives a special smooth and the character of this wine. This is very perfect with a chocolate dessert, a dark chocolate with a blue cheese. This is a fantastic wine from the, the DO Montilla Moriles. Thank you. Completely agree. And so you can see that that bottle, which from time you can see in um, your, you know, if you would purchase it again, would probably come with that label is um, definitely something that's I've just had a piece of chocolate. Very good with chocolate. Very good blue cheese. You need something big with it. Um, the uh, other thing that's interesting about it and I've put here is it's a single vintage wine because actually a lot of the wines we have had here, I think all of them every single one of them except this have been uh, through some kind of blending system whereas this has is a single vintage uh, and in a way that's much more challenging for for the winemaker for for because it's it's that that's what you get it means you don't necessarily get it every year um which you don't but when you get it golly it's good um and indeed for one of the wines in this range that they have they certainly they got 100 parker points but uh, there are trends happening in in sherry too where you will find um 
single vintage wines being produced. But what's amazing is this extraordinary range of styles and categories. As I said, a style for every lifestyle. And um, they'll get, if you want a sweet wine from Mont Montilla Marilis, golly, they can give it to you. But at the same time, they can give you a Fino from the same grape variety. So just to sum up then, um, before I start answering any more of your questions, uh, how to serve this. And I found this little picture on, on a pavement. And um, uh, it's essential, and I'm, I'm sure you're all using it, to use a tulip shaped glass. Uh, don't worry about getting a special glass. Don't put it in the smaller glass. These are not liqueurs. And because they have, um, as the question before, you know, because they have such an aroma, or you just want to be able to sit and smell them. So you don't need to put very much in the glass. Um, uh, it, but enough to be able to rotate it. And of course, when you rotate a PX, it goes like those orange screens you used to see in sort of Victorian gift shops, which were covering on the seaside, which were covering the windows so that the sunlight didn't get in. It absolutely stains the glass. Serve, now I had this uh, information from the Conseca Regulador in Jerez, uh, but I wouldn't necessarily follow it so i would say yes serve fino and manzanilla so, so the first three that we have serve them chilled um and they'll just they'll give it back to you in spades and as they warm up in the glass then you'll see other characteristics coming now they say that if you have one of these oxidated wines where the color has developed because the oxygen has come in contact with the wine that there isn't any flaw um then serve them a bit warmer they suggest 12 to 14, which seems relatively high to me. And then they say, if you have an older wine, um, then you should um, have it even a bit warmer still, treat it more like a table wine. Now, what's interesting was actually that if you can remember back to our, our two uh, representatives from wineries, they both said, serve this a little chilled. So uh, you might want to think about going back to the Oloroso and the Palo Cortado and making sure that they're a bit chilled. And if it looks like the weather's going to be warm this weekend where you are, then definitely bring it, put them, put them briefly in the fridge and see how it goes. And then definitely um, the guidance on the Conseco website was that PX wine should be served at, PX sweet wine should be served at uh, um, sort of, red wine temperature but actually I think for real enjoyment because of that sweetness I like them chilled but of course you can put them in cocktails there's a very lovely cocktail that you can do with uh, Montilla Moriles and ginger ale and equally there are a whole range of New York uh, barista cocktails that you can do with sherry and I used to be really a purist about this but actually um thinking well this is sherry you can't possibly do uh, anything with you know with Pedro Jimenez it's absolutely not the thing but actually now I think these are great wines and what's so interesting about them is that because they're they've got such intrinsic character when you mix them with something else they, the character still persists so you, you can give you can use a bit of sherry to give flavoring to things and then you'll find that actually it enhances the whole drink so I'm, I'm, I'm pro cocktails now, which maybe I never was before. So I will um, finish by saying yes, cocktails, and also a number of producers in this region are using their wines to make vermouth. And I think that's quite interesting. You start off, um, you start off with uh, a very well-made sherry, and then you, then you make vermouth. Um, I mean, if you think about it, there's, there are there are some quite famous wines. Uh, I guess Harvest Bristol Cream comes into mind, which was a blend of all sorts of different sherries, uh, and then that with a large ice cube and a lot of slice of orange again is um, very striking. So now let's think about some questions. So I have here Natalia. Can I repeat what to eat with? wine number two well natalia i don't want to be too prescriptive about this because i genuinely think that you will find it you know i think this is a great opportunity like let's say this weekend to get a whole array of things out now if you're following the the regulation about if it flies if it runs if it swims then this is a wine for the swimmers so you know 
think about sushi, think about prawns. If you've got prawns, you could think about putting them in, you know, with rice, but you can also, um, I actually think this would, this wine has sufficient body because of the, the six years of age that you can have something spicy with it. But they have been having a lot of success with um, Fino and Manzanilla with Japanese food um, in Japan. Now, you know, there are Japanese sherry sommeliers there. So I, I really, you know, there's something to think about. Um, I think that I wouldn't cheerfully put it with cheese. You would, I think what you want to do with something that comes from uh, Sanuka like this is you want to think about the salt. So you want to have it with olives, with anchovies, with uh, capers, any of those things which have which have come from the sea or have that, that saltiness. And um, golly, they will they and the great thing about that is you either have it as an aperitif or you have it with a whole meal and they will just get your mouth watering. But I've spent, as I know other people have on this webinar, I've spent uh, many happy uh, hours and days sitting out in the sun uh, with a, a glass of this. And the good thing is that I'm sitting in London now um, and the light is drawing in, uh, but this will keep my, my sensation of sunlight uh, alive and that's super important. So Natalia, I'm, I'm, that's half an answer, but I think you know, you'll find the answer yourself. There'll be something that will ching for you, but think about if it swims and that might get you quite a long way. So, Paul, why are these wines so undervalued and underpriced? Well, I hadn't mentioned the fact because that they are so underpriced uh, because uh, it always makes um, the people from uh, Sherry and Montilla frustrated because very many people begin the presentation saying, well, the great thing about these wines is they're so cheap. And the other thing that people say, and I was um, outraged to see the other day, uh, I hope you were too, um, in Saturday's Times, they had an article by a really uh, uh, very interesting, I think he's an English journalist who's living in Spain, who's been doing a series of really fascinating stories for the, for the Times about what's happening in Spain. And he went down to Jerez and I thought, oh, great, because we've got a whole page three, two thirds of it on Jerez and Sherry. And it's a kind of main headline. The feature was that this was the wine that your granny would drink. And it's like, no, that happened years ago. Um, so, um, and in fact, there are all sorts of interesting trends and we've seen some here, but we have wines of great purity, great quality, uh, great character. So I think um, there are structural reasons we can't really go into here for, for the uh, how um, Sherry lost its market. But I think what did come was you know, a big shake up, as you know, in the, in the last five, 10 years. And I think what's important to do about it is now that there are Spanish restaurants, Spanish specialist um, bars and um, uh, independent wine shops open that there's the understanding of Spanish culture, not as a kind of second poor relation to Italian pizza houses, that, you know, that there is a joy in the great ingredients that we get from Spain and how they make such delicious, delicious foods. So I think we're getting back to seeing it as a quality thing, because when I first started drinking sherry, which was really, you know, a long time ago, last century, it was just natural that you should do so. I went to Cambridge University and my tutor gave me, when I was reading out my essay to him, gave me a glass of sherry, which is quite an interesting thing to do with an 18 year old. Um, so it was the custom that's changed. And what I love about it now is that we have, uh, it's a much more open thing. People can choose what they want, how they want. And I guess, take, uh, take, uh, uh, you know, take it while, while, while you can. Roger's question matches with this, which is, is sherry consumption still in decline? It's changing. Roger, it's really changing. So um, there was a time when uh, sherry was crushed by um, the, uh, the government had to expropriate a, a company which had owned uh, far too many but I guess they, it was a business with interests all over the place. And you suddenly discovered that Sherry was collapsing into the hands of very few corporate people. And it became, it had a time when it was a very much a uh, corporate product. Uh, and now we're getting people coming out from what we're seeing here, producing the, the best of what they have in different characterful ways. So um, what we are noticing is that the Finos and Manzanias, the first, um, 
two and three that we have here are uh, definitely establishing themselves, along with other white wines that people might drink. They're another great choice. The others are, which are really the jewels, you know, whether you're in Montilla Mariles or you're, you're in Jerez, uh, are, um, are specialist wines, these wines with age. They maybe take a bit of understanding, but they're great, great food matching. Uh, but Roger, thank you for asking the question because all of us need to go away and agree to drink more of them. So uh, yes, Roger, um, use ice, ice or um, in cocktails, definitely. Uh, I have no shame with using ice, it's the same. In those days when I used to go to the pub and I'm hoping to go back next week, um, then ice in red wine or whatever. Um, and then, um, yeah, Eric, you, you're recommending Sprite or 7up. I think it's the mint and lime I like as well. But I think look into some of the American baristas because they really are beginning to do, uh, there's some good competitions there and they're beginning to do really complex drinks. Um, um, so Phil, can I comment on where these examples sit on the scale of sherries in terms of cost quality? Well. I think uh, the first two, um, so we have here Lagita uh, and the uh, Barbadillo Soya are very representative of their region. They'll be very well known because they're the ones that people would be buying half bottles of and glasses and, um, and taking to the spring fairs. They're all around. And you will see that uh, these um, bodegas and some others produce uh, bunting and uh, all sorts of printed materials, which you see um, all over the, the, the towns and villages during the fairs. So you can see that you're either in a Solia um, event or you're in a in a like eater sponsored event. They have they really add to the party feeling. Uh, and what's important about that is that always you know, food has been served with it. It's just I think a British characteristic to drink and not to eat. But you know that's the important thing with these. Um, then it's. Uh, um, in terms of cost, I don't think any of these are going to cost you anything you worry about. I put the prices up and I now I haven't got them here, but I haven't got, um, uh, you know, you will spend so much more on practically anything else. Um, so, um, yeah. So then Chris, Chris, PX wines are so often associated with sweet wines. Is this a future for PX Fino Dry? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I can remember. It's, it's another complicated story about Montilla Morelia's, which is so great to have um, the wines here today for you to show, is I used to drink a lot of Montilla Morelia's Fino. Um, and it's now less available than it should be, because I think, you know, you taste this wine from uh, Albear and there are other producers, they, you know, it's, it's a lovely Fino. And, you know, as he said, said in the film, it's his flagship. So it's, I think it's a question of our demanding it. Um, for Montilla Morelia's and Sherry really started at the, uh, you know, this, they had both have an extremely long history in wine. We're talking centuries. Um, and yet for some reason, um, Sherry has, has uh, been able to make greater noise. Well, I guess there are more wineries, uh, there are more people to make the noise and so on. Um, uh, the, 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 there's um, centuries of history there. But um, now I think is the chance to, to step out. And I think this, this um, tasting by the Big Fortified Tasting uh, is, is really part of it. There was a, a big conference in, in Spain last year where we had a great meeting about uh, the great wines of Andalusia, uh, which um, in a way it's a secret um, needing to be told. We go on holiday to Andalusia. People go to Malaga, to Marbella. They go around to these lovely coast atlantic coast but they they don't drink it enough which brings me to jacob's question uh which jacob is saying you know i like the occasional glass of sherry but i rarely drink through a half bottle well in that case well uh you i mean the thing is that actually these things last longer than you think jacob you know they, that's what i love about a screw cap um they really you know, you can just screw it up again and put it in the fridge and you will be surprised how long these things last. And I'll, you know, if you talk to some producers, they'll say, well, you know, once you've opened it, you should drink it in three days, which I'm sure that, you know, some of us would be glad to do. But um, Jacob, I think you could keep it for quite a bit longer. I mean, I think the way you store it is the most important thing. And don't forget, 
if you have uh, you know any of these wines and that includes the the um, finos and the manzanillas will last unopened you know can be bottled can be cheerfully bottle aged um obviously the oloroso um the oxidative styles the browner styles are extremely stable you know they've had the exposure to oxygen and they're fine so um these are in every case i think the smallest one you can get i stand to be corrected by um of people here are, who are who are selling it you can look around but i think definitely um I'd, I'd, I'd keep that half bottle and you'll be surprised. And don't forget, uh, you know, it does, if you've got halfway through it and now want to change to another half bottle, that half bottle will make you exceptional, exceptional um, sourcing or, you know, um, it's, we, we've, all, we've always got a use, <laughs> use at home in the kitchen. Um, uh, Eric, uh, you, yes, it's worth commenting that Montemarillas can't make sherry as it's protected name in the same way champagne is. Many people put Montemarillas in with sherry. I, M Eric, that's absolutely correct. For instance, we I remember when I was judging uh, a few years back, I was chairing the Spanish panel for the Decanter World Wine Awards, and we found a Montemarillas wine, which we wanted to give a gold medal to. And the people classifying it, sort of backstage people who you know can't be experts in every category, had put it in with sherry. It's like no, <laughs> this you can't judge these wines together, and they're they're not the same. You know, this is a Montilla Morales and deserves its own gold medal in its own category. Um, and I think we, uh, you know. Uh, Montilla Morelos has, for all sorts of reasons, not not been looked at carefully enough, um, and it's it's up to us now to ask and to ask for the double name. These are, uh, you know, this is a double named. There are only a few of them in uh, in Spain. There's Utia Requena, that's the nearest one I can think of. But you know, ask for Montilla Morelos, not just for Montilla, and ask for it by name. I think I sound like an old advert there, but it's it's super important. Yes, Sherry is a is is a registered name, and I must say. You know, I can certainly remember um, Cyprus sherry, South African sherry. Uh, I remember being in Australia when we had a tasting of what they used to call Fino, and they had to find another name for it. Is it Apero now? Uh, well, I'm glad they did because that sherry and that's Montilla Marillas and nobody else can make it. And I think when you taste that that PX from um, Montilla Marillas, then you can see that. But also, and when you taste the Fino CB, um, that's interesting. I would, uh, this is a pheno for sure. I'd have to fight with myself a little bit to, to say, well, is it sherry or is it Montilla Morelis? Um, it maybe has a little bit more ri richness, um, you know, that, that's finessing, but it's, it's just a, a wine that gives a huge amount of pleasure. Um, question from Michael, what's my favourite style? Um, do you know, I um uh you know it depends on the time of day doesn't it uh but i think that there's one that isn't here um we because we couldn't cover everything and we wanted to give you that choice of man's and ears and that's no montiado and maybe it's uh it's that uh, compromise it, it's that thing that which has been um a fino and at some point has got older and older and has become oxidative the floor has died it has a memory of its poetry here we are this is the great thing about sherry montilla you can go into poetry it has a memory of its uh, ethereal past and now it's becoming a uh, more full-bodied and it's a terrifically terrifically good wine um so yeah that's my um that i think is my definite answer and on that uh, i think we've got it's time to say now over to you. You have these wines, and I hope you will. Well, I hope you'll find several favourites. I think that really there are so many different styles here, and each one for a different time of the day. So, thank you very much for your attention. And well, when you get to it, have a great weekend. But before I get there, I'd just like to thank Extender, who are uh, working on the behalf of uh, Andalusia, and particularly my colleagues at the Big Fortified Tasting, who've done a great job here and have brought us these lovely wines and of course the bodegas who supplied them. Thank you.